see. We should, we've got participants coming through. Hi, everybody. My name is Alice Christman. I am the Senior Manager of Marketing at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Welcome to the Brock Learning Series. It's going digital. Uh, and we have a great program set up for you today. You're not going to see much of me until the end. I am going to be the chat manager, making sure I'm addressing any questions and throwing in some links into the chat. Uh, with that being said, I am really excited to pass the microphone to the one, the only, Mr. Tanner Council. Tanner, take it away. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, taking your Tuesday night to join us. Um, this is part of the Brock Environmental Center Learning Series. And it's a program that was very popular that we did at our uh, Brock Environmental Center in Virginia Beach. Um, and if you haven't um, been, been there or heard about it, Alice is going to put a link in there that you can um, click on and visit later for a tour, a virtual tour of the building. But the premise of the program is just to um, get everybody together and learn together. And we choose topics based on current headlines and based on popular demand. And tonight's topic uh, falls under both categories, both rationales. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about our fisheries during the current economic shutdown. And at the outset of the statewide lockdowns, watermen were hurting pretty bad. And um, their troubles started making headlines. And we have seen some remediation in those fisheries for, for the watermen, but they're by no means out of the woods. So we wanted to um, give you all some more insight into how these fisheries work, who some of the players are in these fisheries, and importantly, what you can do to help support those fisheries. Um, and uh, if, later on in the presentation, we wanna give you an opportunity uh, to uh, take further action to support clean water uh, and these iconic fisheries that we're gonna discuss tonight. Um, just by way of a little bit of housekeeping, um, Alice, our, our great production assistant here, um, she's gonna be monitoring the Q&A and the chat. So keep an eye on the chat where she'll be dropping links throughout the presentation that are pertinent as we go through the, the topics. And uh, the, you can add, add questions there or in the Q&A. Um, tonight, you're gonna hear from three CBF staff members and two gentlemen involved in the fisheries that we're gonna discuss. And if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce those folks very quickly, and then we'll move on to the, uh, to the heart of the matter. Chris Moore, um, who you'll hear um, from in and out of the presentation tonight, is our uh, senior regional ecosystem scientist. Uh, where he leads policy development and technical support for a variety of Chesapeake Bay water quality and uh, fisheries restoration efforts. It involves a wide range of activities from on the ground restoration to working with elected officials through all levels of government. It's not uncommon to see Chris outside in sunglasses and shorts on Monday and then in a tie and suit on Thursday uh, out on his boat um, as he uh, patrols the halls of the legislature and our, and our waterways. Um, he uh, is also a U.S. Coast Guard licensed captain and runs educational and restoration boat trips for volunteers, for media, for elected officials, and other decision makers. Chris lives in Virginia Beach with his wife, Kristen, uh, his children, and his dog, Nosset. And he's an avid sportsman. Um, he is, uh, spends as many days as possible out of the waters and the tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, next up, you're gonna hear from Audrey Swannenberg. And uh, Audrey is our Chesapeake Oyster Alliance uh, manager. So this is a, a new uh, uh, campaign that's designed to put 10 billion oysters into the bay by 2025. Uh, prior to joining CBF, uh, Audrey co-founded and managed Chesapeake Farm to Table, which connected a network of 30 plus farmers with chefs in Baltimore through an online ordering website and twice weekly delivery service. And finally, uh, the third staff member that you'll hear from is Allison Colden, who is our Maryland fishery scientist. She develops the foundation's fishery policy, policy initiatives in Maryland and provides technical expertise to CBF's oyster restoration program. Before joining CBF, Allison managed government relations to restore America's estuaries, Ray, and served as a NOAA Sea Grant NOS legislative fellow. Uh, she holds PhD in fishery science from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And Allison is actually a Virginia Beach uh, native, but she lives now up in Maryland uh, near our headquarters and uh, where she lives with her husband, Joe, and dog, Bismarck. Two other folks that you're gonna hear from, and we have watermen on this webinar, which you might say, wait, how did you do that? Uh, because they spend most of their time on their boats and at the docks. Uh, but we're gonna hear from Tommy Leggett 
And Tommy Leggett is actually a former employee with uh, CBF. He was an oyster restoration specialist with us and managed much of our oyster restoration work through the, two, uh, th through the 2000s. He started as a waterman, went, came to work for CBF for a while, and then he went back to his roots in aquaculture. And you're also going to hear from Gardner Douglas, who's known as the Oyster Ninja. And uh, he will live up to his name in a video that, we've, uh, that he prepared for us to share specifically for this uh, webinar. And he's an internationally ranked oyster shucker from the Eastern Shore now living in DC. So with that, I will pass it off to Chris Moore. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, Tanner, thanks for all the introductions and Alice for, for doing all the background and, and making this run. So fisheries, you know, in, in, in my thinking, one of the most important aspects of the Chesapeake Bay and one of the really neatest aspects of the Chesapeake Bay as we all know, the Chesapeake Bay is an estuary. And what does that mean? That means an area where freshwater and saltwater mix. And so one of the great things when it comes to the fisheries of Chesapeake Bay, the fact that we have really freshwater species like white perch and largemouth bass in the northern end of the bay to very, very saltwater species, basically ocean species, like the, the picture you see here of, of what I think is one of the prettiest fish uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, which is a, a red drum. A lot of times we refer to them as puppy drum, especially when they're small. But uh, down here in the southern part of the bay, we also see, you know, a, a large number of sharks. We see uh, what most people think of as fish and going species like Spanish mackerel and cobia as well. And so uh, the Chesapeake Bay really is a uniquely vibrant area to be involved in fisheries. And and it's, uh, it, it's, it's just amazing from a day-to-day -day basis and a season-to-season -season basis as to what you may see out there in the bay. You know, the, the winter time, we think of the fact that it's really cold and there's not much going on, but that's the time of year when actually uh, juvenile menhaden are migrating into the Chesapeake Bay, kind of the dead of winter. Uh, not long after that, the crabs start to stir up. Uh, then we get into early summer and striped bass become abundant uh, as they spawn and then head back out to, to join the coastal population. And some of our summer species like Spanish and cobia show up. Um, uh, for, for their summers here, and, and then those species start to migrate out in the fall. So there really is a, a great variety of what goes on throughout the year, and it's really neat to see that change throughout the season. So CBF has really taken a, a, a large investment in both the management of the fisheries within Chesapeake Bay and also using them as a tool to educate and engage our citizenry. Um, the State of the Bay Report, which the most current version is the 2008, which is the cover there, um, it's divided in three sections. And, and one of those three sections is fisheries. And when I, I think of fisheries as it comes to the Bay for a lot of people, and as they read this report, uh, you know, I, I think most people have their fondest connection to the Chesapeake Bay through its fisheries. Whether you like to go out and catch striped bass, you know, in the fall when it's nice and chilly, whether you like to eat oysters uh, in, the, in the dead of winter, uh, or whether you like to sit down in the heat of summertime um, to a big steaming bushel of, of blue crabs. Um, that is, is the real connection that many people have to the Chesapeake Bay. And um, it, it really does bring a tremendous amount of not only economical um, activity to the area, but it's just a fabric of our culture here in the Chesapeake Bay region. So um, this is always a neat topic to be talking, uh, talking about. So getting into some things that affect fisheries before we actually start talking about fisheries. And this is actually a slide from NOAA that I love because one, it, it pulls together so many different things that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation focuses on. Uh, you hear us talk a lot about water quality. And so you can see on this slide uh, the, the fact that the nutrient inputs that we, that we work so hard on from agricultural operations, from sewage treatment plants to stormwater and development, uh, those types of activities bring us clearer water, which helps with habitat. Uh, those activities make for a better uh, forage base for a lot of our species, uh, but they do have a, a, a very tangential effect um, to the various fisheries that are out there. Uh, kind of moving on the slide to the top right corner, you see weather or, or climate. And you know we, we work uh, a lot on climate change issues in Chesapeake Bay. And, Allison will talk a little bit about this uh, later in, in her discussion about striped bass, but weather conditions, climatic patterns are definitely affecting all of the different species in Chesapeake Bay. 
Uh, striped bass is, is a prime example of that. And obviously this slide focuses on striped bass, but it's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the many species that is affected by that. Uh, another thing that's affected by, by the weather or the climate in any given year is the spawning success of our fish. How many fish or crabs or oysters are gonna be reproduced in any given year? Uh, really damp, cold springs is really good for striped bass spawning activity, believe it or not. Um, hot summers tend to be better for oyster reproduction. Uh, wet, cool summers, as we really experienced a couple years ago, are really bad for oyster production, unfortunately. Uh, blue crabs, believe it or not, one of the main drivers at times in of blue crabs into Chesapeake Bay in the late summer, early fall, are tropical systems as they move their way up the coast. So all these different factors uh, affect populations in any given year. Um, it, as you're looking at the slide as well, you can see that obviously lots of different things eat different things in Chesapeake Bay. This is obviously focused on the important predator-prey relationship between striped bass and menhaden, but predators eat all sorts of different things. Blue crabs eat oysters. Uh, blue crabs are eaten by striped bass and cobia. Um, you know, you name it, uh, there, there's a, just a very complex and very vibrant food web that's out in the Chesapeake Bay. And then the last thing, uh, kind of in the top center here, are our various fisheries. We have obviously uh, many different fisheries in Chesapeake Bay, and, and many of them are managed in some way, shape, or form. Um, and obviously, you hear a lot about you know, how management actions may be affecting fisheries in any given year and things like that. And so it is an important overall piece of that. And the last thing there, um, you know, the amount of dissolved oxygen, um, it's one of the key elements uh, in terms of having successful populations of fish that, that aren't stressed and, and are, uh, uh, they have an ability to go out there, forage um, for other, other species and things like that. When we have a, a, a bay dead zone or a lack of oxygen, it takes habitat away from a lot of different species. And so that obviously is, is directly connected to the nutrient inputs there. Uh, but it's something that that really is important. Um, so when you when you hear stories about the dead zone in the, in the middle of summer, don't just think about the fact that it's low oxygen water. Think about all the different impacts it has on these different species that are out there as well. So moving into oysters first, uh, obviously one of the iconic fisheries in Chesapeake Bay, and not only are they in, an incredibly important fishery, uh, they're an incredibly important habitat as well. And, and that's one of the reasons that Chesapeake Bay Foundation, along with a, really an innumerable number of partners, has been focused on oyster restoration um, for the last 20 years or so. Uh, they obviously build great habitat. And uh, you see this is an intertidal reef that was actually built in partnership with the Elizabeth River Project down here in the Hampton Roads area. You see this kind of brown shell, which, which brown in terms of an oyster reef means it's lively area. Uh, you can actually see some reef balls in the bottom right corner of this picture. Uh, those are habitats that not only uh, help create spaces for oysters, but they do a great job protecting um, or creating habitat for other fish as well. And you can see here too, this particular project was done in an area that still has its connectivity to kind of the upland. And so you can see some of the trees and some of the marsh grass and things like that are there. But um, for years now, uh, like I said, a, a number of different partners have been focused on restoring the, these very vibrant habitats, which are just unfortunately a fraction of what they, what they were, uh, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And, and what we're seeing by and large is these restoration efforts have been very successful. We keep getting better at them every year and uh, they're going to provide water quality benefits because remember oysters filter uh, the water to get their food sources out. Uh, they're going to provide habitat benefits and one of the things that is going to become even more important uh, in the future is they have big climate resiliency and um, work functions as well and, and that's going to help our ecosystem become more resilient. So what does oyster restoration success look like? And so uh, these two pictures here kind of kind of show it at different stages in success. The first picture is actually from uh, the Nature Conservancy, which is another partner in our oyster restoration efforts in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, these are, are what we call spat, baby oysters, uh, just probably about a month old, maybe a little bit older than that. Uh, but when, when you have a spat set that is covering the substrate uh, that heavily, uh, you know you've done an oyster restoration project that's starting out on the right foot. You know, you're basically those oyster shells that were put down as part of that project 
completely covered up. And not all those oysters are going to live. Some of them are probably going to be eaten by blue crabs. Some of them are going to be outcompeted. But as they continue to grow, they're going to create that really, really important three-dimensional habitat that uh, will, will bring in lots of other organisms, uh, but it'll also provide uh, habitats for uh, blue crabs to hide, for other fish to forage on, and things like that. And so when we see a picture like that of a oyster restoration project uh, in progress, we're really happy. Uh, then the picture on the right um, is what a, a successful project looks like, you know, two, three, four years down the road, depending upon where in the Chesapeake Bay it is. Uh, oysters grow faster when the water temps are higher and when the salinities are higher. So oysters tend to grow faster in the southern portions of the bay um, because of our longer growing season and our salty water. But you can see even on this picture, there's probably at least two, maybe three year classes of oysters. You can see how those oysters are growing up into the water column. They're creating that really um, important three-dimensional habitat that we want to see um, for other species and also uh, you know, when these reefs are built along the shoreline, like the previous picture that we saw, um, they're creating a, a really resilient system that can help the bay in, in a number of different ways. So getting into the actual, how many oysters do we catch uh, in any given year? This is actually a slide from the Virginia Marine Resources Commission uh, that, that shows you the two different components of our oyster fishery in Virginia. Uh, the Light blue is what we call the public harvest in Virginia. And so that's what would you think of as that kind of, a kind of iconic waterman who's out there harvesting oysters, either using hand tongs or a dredge or a patent tong um, off the public rocks. And that fishery takes place generally both in Maryland and in Virginia from around the 1st of October till around the end of March, uh, give or take based on where they're, they're actually uh, fishing in any given year and based on how the regulations work in any given year. Uh, the darker blue there is what's described as private bushels. And these are basically leases uh, that watermen have had that they are actually using to invest some of their own resources to grow oysters. And, and when they do that, it can vary significantly. It can be as uh, small an investment as just putting some shell or some other sorts of substrate down and going back and, and picking oysters up that have naturally landed on it uh, in a couple of years, or it can be you know, very big floating cage systems and things like that in aquaculture that, um, that there's a tremendous amount of investment in. And so one of the things that is, is gratifying to this slide is that we see that there has really been a growth in the private sector um, over the last 15 to 20 years. And, and these are investments that are people are making uh, because they know water quality is uh, good enough to support oyster harvest. Uh, they know that our, that our oyster stock is on the rebound and they know that they're gonna have a, a positive economic opportunity um, to grow these oysters. Uh, in Maryland, they just released their harvest yesterday. They harvested about 270,000 bushels of oysters uh, from their public grounds last year. Uh, they're still working to compute how many oysters are actually gonna be harvested from their private grounds um, over the last year or so. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Audrey uh, to talk a bit about actually enjoying these tasty bivalves um, you know, throughout the year. That's right, thank you, Chris. So, hi everyone, I'm Audrey Swanenberg. I manage the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance. We are a coalition of 60 organizations from across Maryland and Virginia. Uh, our coalition includes oyster farmers, folks from the academic community, as well as various nonprofits. And we have the big audacious goal of getting 10 billion oysters in the Bay by 2025. And that is going to be no small feat. And we do that work because we care so much about the water filtration capacity of oysters as well as the habitat they provide. So we work in three main pillars. So we work to ensure that there is large scale oyster restoration across the Bay. We want to make sure that there is sound science based management of our public fisheries. And finally, aquaculture. We love aquaculture. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit more about aquaculture. Um, you know, as Chris mentioned, we think aquaculture is a really phenomenal thing to support. If, you know, you care about uh, the Chesapeake Bay, supporting aquaculture means that you're supporting private businesses that are 
active in the recovery of this iconic species. And these are also job creating businesses as well, which is really important to our coastal communities. Um, and so I'd like to pass it off actually to one of our partners, Tommy Leggett um, from Chessie Seafoods. Hello, so I'm Tommy Leggett and uh, primarily what I do now is uh, grow oysters, oyster farming. I also have a commercial uh, waterman's registration card. Uh, the only fishery that I'm active in is uh, striped bass. I started uh, commercial fishing out of grad school after I got a master's degree from the Virginia State of Marine Science. So I had to teach myself how to do all this. And uh, as I learned, it seemed like I was on the tail end of each fishery that I learned how to do. And it's been a, it was a struggle. I made a living. I raised a family. Um, I, I did fairly well for somebody uh, that didn't come from that background. But um, everything was always on the decline. The crab fishery was on the decline. The clam fishery was doing well, but I didn't get into that until late. And by the time I'd figured that out and was doing pretty well at that, that was, that was going downhill and that's all but collapsed. There's only probably less than a dozen guys commercial patent tong clamming anymore. When I was doing it, there was 60 or 70 doing it uh, day in and day out, year round. Um, of course, the oyster fishery, we were all pretty familiar with that. That was that was doing pretty well when I started. And uh, the, the high point that I remember was being in the James River, working out of Menchville, and there was close to 300 boats working out of there one winter. But then we had the, uh, the bouts with uh, Dermo and uh, our oyster landings got down to like 25,000 bushels in, uh, I can't remember the exact date, but it was the late 1990s and early 2000s. And uh, through aggressive fisheries management and restoration and uh, Mother Nature's help, we, uh, we were able to see a, a slight rebound. And I think the overall landings are in the 500 to 700,000 bushel per year range now. So that, that includes the wild harvest and uh, various forms of aquaculture. This year, uh, I had knee replacement surgery in January, so I wasn't able to do any fishing, and I took off a month later and went on vacation for a cruise. And when we came back, the country and the world was essentially shut down from this coronavirus. So uh, this uh, epidemic hasn't really impacted my rockfish business. But when I got back from our vacation, cruise vacation, March 19th, um, everything was shut down. The restaurants had closed up. I primarily sell to restaurants and one distributor. And uh, I was still able to sell a few oysters to the distributor who got creative and started doing a lot of online marketing, direct marketing, um, selling oysters by the dozen, two dozen, three dozen count bags. Um, and they primarily sell to restaurants. They also have their own restaurants, but they were shut down as well. So they had to get creative and come up with something else. So I've been selling about the same number of oysters to that uh, dealer, but there's been essentially no oyster, I mean, restaurant market since March 14th. However, the uh, state opened up restaurants for outside dining two weeks ago where the restaurants can have 50% capacity if they have an outside dining permit. So the last two weeks I've sold a very, very small amount of oysters to a restaurant that will typically get three to 4,000 oysters this time of year. Um, the last two weeks they've gotten about six or 700 oysters each week. So sales to the restaurants are off in a huge, huge way. Um, I've also been going to a local farmers market and that's helping to make up a little bit um it's it's still nowhere near close to what i would typically be selling or what i sold last year but um it helps uh, every little bit helps so i've been figuring that i'm about 50 to 75 percent off in sales and revenue compared to last year all right so as we just heard from Tommy himself, he's not the only one feeling this. I'm sure everyone here can relate that COVID has disrupted all of our lives and certainly it has disrupted the aquaculture industry in major ways. Um, the, the ripple effects from the restaurant closings in mid-March really 
had a had a negative effect. And um, I'm extremely proud of all these farmers. Most of them have pivoted and created brand new marketing strategies to reach home consumers. Um, and so, you know, they've done different pickup options or cold shipping directly to people's homes. But the fact is, it's still only a fraction of what they were historically getting directly working with restaurants and wholesale distributors. And so one of the things um, that we have done as CBF, along with all of our partners in the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance, is advocate at the federal level. And so there, this is a real power that we have as a coalition of all these different organizations across the Bay is to speak to the decision makers and make sure that they are hearing this industry and that this industry is not forgotten. And so we have worked with the Chesapeake Bay Congressional Task Force as well as advocating with USDA to make sure that the oyster farmers of the Chesapeake Bay are included in getting appropriate economic relief that they deserve given the scale of the industry. Um, and so we're really proud to have done that. We've helped raise the voice of over 35 different partners that are part of this coalition in our advocacy work. And, um, you know, we really hope that that's going to move the needle and really help the industry right now as they're hurting so much. Um, but maybe you guys on the webinar tonight, you're wondering, what can you do, right? What can you do? And so um, something that I'd really like to encourage you all to do is to buy oysters, buy local Chesapeake oysters. Every little bit helps these farmers. I think historically, we've obviously had a really strong culture of eating oysters at home. And I would love to see more of that, whether that's backyard barbecues, if that's people shucking at home. I think sometimes people can get a little bit intimidated though about shucking at home. And so that's why we've brought on our friend Gardner Douglas, AKA the Oyster Ninja. Uh, and he did a really great video for us that I'm really excited to share now to hopefully demystify shucking for you all. All right, good people. What you have here is a setup for a perfect oyster knife. Um, we got a selection of oyster knives because you never know what type of oyster you're gonna have. You got your oysters, of course, which we have uh, sugar take oysters from Tom's Cove down on the Eastern shore. Then we got a beverage. We got a nice little platform that's gonna elevate um, when you're shucking, this might come in handy. Um, of course, and a towel to uh, keep position. I don't really use a towel, but um, I think it's good for beginners to have that just so you don't uh, slip or lose traction. I like my board here. This is what I use. Um, so as far as oyster shucking, this is called stabbing. And of course, stabbing is where you uh, have a chest beak stabber, which this is. Um, and then you have, um, well, what it is, is it's got a nice handle to it, a nice um, blade that has a little flex, a little give to it. And that's good when you're going through the uh, through the mouth of the oyster. Now let's go over the oyster real quick. Um, so the oyster, we have the bottom or the cup, and then we have the top or the flat side. We have the back or the hinge, and then we have the front, which is where the mouth is. And before we start, I guess we need to take a sip. Today I got some flying dog. This is the raging. You guys can read that. Um, <laughs> so with going through the front or stabbing, you just apply a little pressure. Now I'm gonna, this is what a towel is for. Let's just imagine if you don't have this, this is just to be your bottom uh, or the table or wherever you're shucking. Now <clears throat> the, the towel is for not only for slip, but so you don't stab yourself, okay? So what you're gonna do is place the tip of the knife into on the edge of the lip of the oyster, apply a little pressure, and then you're in. And once you're in, it'll kind of stay there. Uh, now we're gonna just uh, slide the knife down, guiding it right on the edge of the shell. And the whole time, we're just going back and forth, back and forth. I'm gonna move this house just so you can get a better idea and see clearly. So back and forth, back and forth. And all I'm doing, I'm just gonna move this to the side for a minute, but all I'm doing is just going back and forth, back and forth until I've worked my way all the way and disconnected it. So the oyster is connected to the shell here, of course, and then on the top, the same place. 
So you got to remember that. So to disconnect the top part, I'm going to do the same thing. We're just going to act like the, it's still connected. And I'm just going to slide across. And you've shucked a perfect oyster with the stabbing method. The next method, of course, is your um, hand shucking. Now with hand shucking, and what I'm actually doing is looking for a nice, easy one. And when I say easy, the hinge is easy to see here. And I'm also gonna get, so this is a toad fish, just as good. And this is more, um, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, toad fish is a good one also. I'm gonna use a toad fish because it's easy to get. You can just go on the website and find this. But with the toad fish, you can either turn it like a doorknob or you can just pop it um, like a seesaw. So we're gonna try both. This is, and again, I'm just gonna use a towel. Usually I, I don't use towels, but I'm just gonna show you what you see. Um, I'm gonna, I'm applying pressure. I'm gonna turn it like a doorknob. Boom. And once you're in, you can just slide your knife down. Uh-oh. Turn like a doorknob. Slide your knife down. Boom. And then you're gonna turn it around to yourself and then slide. That's all you're doing. Um, the next way, of course, like I said, is the seesaw. So I'm just applying pressure. Again, you will be using your towel. Apply pressure, applying pressure up, like a seesaw, like I'm going up. You created that, uh, that gap, and this is the gap. As you can see, you can see inside, and you can just slide that knife right on around. Now, this sometimes can be an issue. I'm glad this happened. Um, all it is is where the shell got stuck to the oyster meat, and you're just gonna, right there, it's just like a little cut, and pull it off. Just gonna see if any more shell, and for other shell, you can just pull it off. You don't have to cut, just pull it off. Now remember, all pearls come back to me. And we're gonna disconnect that bottom. And that's shucking, guys. That's so easy. So go find you a good oyster shucking knife. And we also have these oyster ninja knives. Just reach out to me if you like one. Um, get you some something nice to cold to drink. Get you some fresh local oysters. Get you a towel. And you can have fun at your house uh, shucking oysters. Hope you guys enjoy. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. All right, so thanks so much to Gardner for that great instruction. Um, I hope that inspires you all to take on shucking yourself. It would also be really great, um, as we mentioned, Gardner is a nationally ranked shucker, so he's at events around the, um, you know, the Chesapeake region. Give him a follow on social media. He's on Instagram, Facebook. He also has a podcast that Alice included in the chat. Um, but basically, you know, we'd really love to get you folks to buy oysters. Tommy sells them. You guys now feel like you know Tommy, hopefully. Um, CBF is also organizing some pop-up oyster sales with the different aquaculture farmers that we're part of. So email me, um, aswannenberg at cbf.org. Alice will drop that in the link um, if you want to um, buy any oysters through that. And finally, you know, to tie this all together, make sure that you recycle your oyster shells when you're doing your home oyster events. It's incredibly important for our restoration activities that we get recycled oyster shell. They are the favorite home of baby oysters. One single oyster shell can be home for as many as 10 adult oysters. So please do your part, recycle those oyster shells, um, and go boys, buy some farmed oysters and help save the bay. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. So now we want to uh, switch gears a little bit to uh, another one of the Chesapeake Bay's iconic fisheries and, and one of their one of its iconic species as well, uh, the blue crab. Um, uh, some of us may think of them as beautiful swimmers as, as they swim uh, just under the water surface throughout the summer, uh, back and forth. Um, but you know, in a lot of ways, this time of year, especially. Uh, when you think of Chesapeake Bay, you do think of, of blue crabs and, and uh, one, maybe getting pinched by them as you're out wading or, or swimming in the bay. Uh, but I think most of us like to, to sit down and, and actually eat these uh, throughout the summertime. Uh, when it comes to fisheries, uh, blue crabs is, is a great example of a Chesapeake Bay fishery that has very 
vibrant, not only commercial fisheries, but recreational fisheries as well. Uh, up in Maryland, uh, there's a, a, a large contingent of folks who use trot lines. So if you've never seen a trot line before, uh, think about a, a long line, a couple hundred, a couple uh, hundred yards in some cases, uh, that has bait spread out over it, and uh, you you run your boat beside that, you pull the pull the trot line up, and the crabs are connected to the bait. Um, down in 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 Virginia, we think more people using different baits uh, along the shoreline uh, to actually uh, lure those crabs and as they pull those baits up they actually um, will, will dip those with a little dip net. Uh, in addition uh, a lot of people deploy crab pots uh, from their home or from their dock or their boat slip and one thing I want to make sure uh, people are aware of especially if you're deploying crab pots uh, from your from your home where you've got a lot of marshes and things like that uh, one of the things you can help do to conserve other species primarily the, the diamondback terrapin is install what we call turtle excluder devices or, or TEDs um, on the funnels to your crab pots. And what that'll do is it, it will keep uh, turtles, which love going into crab pots, out of your crab pots. It won't cut down on the number of crabs or the size of crabs you, you keep, uh, but it's a good way to, to help uh, protect some of those other really unique bay critters out there when you're trying to catch some crabs for your family. So thinking a little bit about the commercial fishery, and, and I think from, from the bay perspective, when we think about the Chesapeake Bay uh, blue crab fishery, this is what most people think of. Uh, you know, the, the Chesapeake Bay dead rise there to the right, uh, crab pots kind of stacked up that are deployed uh, in the main stem of the bay in, in, in Maryland, uh, in Virginia. Uh, we use this type of gear throughout the Chesapeake Bay uh, and, and the tributaries as well. But this is really a diverse fishery. Uh, not only do you have what we call hard crab pots like this, but uh, watermen use what we call peeler pots uh, to catch the, the very delicious soft shells, uh, especially in the spring uh, around the full moon. Uh, but we also have crab pounds. We, we talked about trot lines earlier. Uh, we have scrapes and we have people that actually dip for blue crabs. And so with the crab scrape and the, and the crab dippers, basically what they're doing is going along uh, those very vibrant Chesapeake Bay underwater grasses, sometimes referred to as, as submerged aquatic vegetation or SAV, and they're actually capturing those crabs that are in there, uh, in some cases actually molting, and in some cases uh, getting ready to reproduce uh, for various markets. So it, it, it is a, a, a very diverse fishery, and depending upon if you're uh, looking for kind of pit crab meat, a lot of that comes out of Virginia because that's where uh, a fair amount of our picking infrastructure has been historically. Uh, up in Maryland, we think more people selling um, the, the males, number ones, number twos, jimmies, and things like that for steaming. And uh, a lot of times we refer to that as the basket trade. Uh, part of the reason for that difference in the two states in the fishery is that as crabs mature, uh, the adult females tend to migrate back down into the lower portions of the Chesapeake Bay to reproduce where their eggs uh, are, are eventually swept out to sea and then the crabs start to migrate back in. So the catch in Virginia tends to be about 70, 30 uh, females to males. Uh, in Maryland, the opposite of that. It's about 70, 30 um, males to females. And obviously that bounces around from year to year, but that's the general trend. So a little bit about how we manage the fishery and how we know if blue crab population in Chesapeake Bay is healthy in any given year. And fortunately, we have one of the best data sets uh, of any Chesapeake Bay fishery uh, with what's called the winter dredge survey uh, that happens each year. We can also call it the crab population survey, but this tends to start in December of each year. It finishes up in usually early March, depending upon how bad or, the, or good the weather has been. And it's a great partnership between both Maryland and Virginia who manage the species. And what you see there on the right is the actual crab dredge that they used to do this. And this is just like a commercial waterman would have used uh, in, the, in the crab dredge fishery that we used to have here in Virginia. Basically, they put this piece of gear down uh, for a minute tow it across the bottom and then they, they bring up everything that they, they catch and uh, obviously count those. Um, they measure the sizes if, if uh, they're males and females. And uh, once they do all that sampling, um, they use some, some mathematical models to help determine what the population looks like in any given year. Uh, the graph or the chart there on the left um, is, shows the about, 
about 1,500 sites that they manage to sample in any given year. Obviously, a little bit dependent upon the weather and things like that. But you can see there's three different kind of strata of that. So those are uh, mid-bay areas, obviously the tributaries, and then the lower bay areas as well. And actually, this year, talking with the folks who run the survey, they actually even did a few samples out in the ocean because one of the things they thought about, and this is kind of one of those climate change aspects, is because we had such a warm winter that instead of the crabs coming down to the lower bay and kind of settling into their semi-hibernated state for the winter, they kind of kept moving out in the ocean. And uh, that may have happened. Uh, some of our commercial watermen uh, indicated they were catching lots of crabs out in the ocean in their gill nets in the various winter fisheries out there. Uh, but the survey did not find uh, a whole lot of those. But um, after that, after all this work happens throughout the winter, uh, usually in late April, early May of, of each year, we start uh, or we hear about the results from this. And so uh, this is just one component of, uh, of the survey results, but I'll, I'll kind of condense um, a lot of information into to one slide. Uh, the number of crabs were, was down this year. Uh, no secret about that. Um, we, when we think about the blue crab population, we, we think about, in, in a lot of ways, the most important component of this is the adult females, because those are the ones that are going to um, reproduce in that next growing season, you know, starting about this time of year um, and, and create the next generation of blue crabs. But uh, we also uh, look at the number of males in the population and we also look at the number of juveniles out there because a, a juvenile blue crab that's captured during the winter dredge survey actually is usually has grown enough just in one growing season that it's, that it's legal uh, approximately five inches to actually be caught in the various commercial fisheries by, by midsummer, early fall. So that's a big indicator of one, how, how successful spawning was in the previous year, but also what the back end or the second half of our fishing season may um, look like. So uh, I've talked about the first bullet there, second bullet, um, recent management actions. Back in 2008, uh, Virginia and Maryland uh, really got together and uh, put forth a comprehensive management plan that focused on managing this female component of the population better. And you can see that it's not perfect. Uh, we have obviously had a couple lows since then, but generally you can see that we've been on an upward trend in terms of the number of females out there. And so with this graph, you can see it's not only the numbers of, of crabs that are out there, but there's two lines there. The top line is the green line. Uh, in the fisheries management world, that's what we call a target. And that's, as you would expect, the number we want to be around. Um, we don't need to be right at it. We don't need to be above it. But we generally want to be bouncing around it um, in any given year. And you can see the, the red line there below. Um, that's the threshold. And that's kind of the number that we don't want to go below um, in order to make sure that we have a healthy and, and robust population. So um, you can see since 2008, uh, in the time period that we've been doing the winter dredge survey, um, we've actually been above the target two of the three times uh, that we've been doing this survey. So you can see our management actions are, are leading to positive results in the blue crab population. And you can see we, we see some pretty big changes from year to year. And that's because uh, blue crabs are very short-lived uh, out in the Chesapeake Bay. And one year's spawning success uh, really leads to uh, a correlation in terms of of how many of those blue crabs recruit into the population and end up becoming adults. And so we can see some, some pretty big swings in that. Um, however, it's not, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if you look in the, the mid 90s to early 2000s, kind of like Tommy was referring to earlier when the population crashed, um, not only were the numbers were low, but we didn't have those big swings in the population. And that's a good indicator that the population was stressed and not reproducing like it should. Um, you can see once we get past 2008, we start to see some of those big increases. That, that's showing us that there's uh, more females out there. And when those water quality conditions and those climatic or weather conditions all line up, they have been able to spawn successfully. That's a good sign. So uh, not, not a perfect year, but, but overall a pretty good year um, for our blue crab population and one where you can go out and enjoy some blue crabs this summer um, after having your oysters. So we want to switch gears now to one of our finfish species, and I'm going to turn it over to Allison to talk about striped bass. Thanks, Chris, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to uh, 
crush this uh, Brock Learning series uh, from our Maryland office, but um, many of you may know that striped bass is one of our iconic fin fish fisheries in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Maryland and Virginia are responsible for the majority of the harvest of striped bass along the Atlantic coast. Not only that, next slide, Chris. Uh, we are also the most important epicenter of striped bass reproduction. So about 70% of all the striped bass that are a part of the Atlantic coastal stock are spawned right here in Chesapeake Bay. And the map that you can see on the right hand side gives you an indication of where the majority of these fish are spawning. So when you see these very large fish coming up in, in the springtime, they're moving up into these tributaries and headwaters of those tributaries to spawn. So not only is it an important from a commercial and recreational uh, harvest perspective, but Chesapeake Bay is also extremely important to the production of striped bass all along the East Coast. Um, next slide, please. The East Coast uh, stock of striped bass, so the striped bass we see in the Chesapeake Bay are part of what we call the coastal migratory stock. After a few years of, of being spawned in the Chesapeake Bay, we're using the Chesapeake Bay as a nursery to, to grow from a juvenile to several years old, a lot of these fish, particularly the females, will travel offshore into what we call the coastal migratory stock. So that means that if you uh, see a large female fish in the Chesapeake Bay and several months later travel to Massachusetts, for example, those could be the same um, group of fish that were in the Chesapeake Bay just months before. And because uh, we have multiple states fishing on the same population of striped bass, Striped bass are actually managed by uh, a regional fisheries management body known as the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And in the logo you see there, you can see all of the states that cooperatively manage striped bass. And an interesting tidbit is that this commission was um, put in place by Congress, but was actually first put in place for the cooperative management of this species. So in order to make management decisions on how both the commercial and recreational fisheries for striped bass are managed, uh, both Maryland and Virginia participate as partners in the uh, Atlantic States Commission. We want to talk a little bit about um, where we are in terms of striped bass populations. And Chris did a great job on the blue crab slide. Um, showing you what one of these graphs typically looks like. So this is a similar graph for striped bass, where the shaded area in the background uh, is a measure of how many female spawning striped bass there are in the population. Uh, and the tan line that you see represents the number of recruits or juvenile striped bass uh, that were born this year. And the two horizontal lines that you see, the top again is the target and the lower one is the threshold, but unlike crabs, which are in between the target and threshold, you can see that that shaded area falls well below uh, the dotted line, which is the threshold. And so what this means from a management perspective is we're in a danger zone. We're in an area where managers uh, need to take action because our goal is to get that shaded area back up to the solid horizontal line, back up to that target uh, in the green zone where we feel like the population is in a good place. Chris? So we want to know, and managers in Maryland and Virginia wanted to know, what are the main drivers that are causing some of these issues that we are seeing with striped bass? And one of the things, among others, that they uh, pinpointed was uh, this issue of what we call post-release mortality. So in this graph here, it's showing the number of striped bass, both that are harvested, meaning you caught the fish, put it in your cooler, and uh, took it home with you, but the tan part of the bar that you see on the top there represents those fish that are caught and released, but then uh, die after they're released. Either it's because of injuries that were sustained when they were caught and released. It has to do with um, other physiological stressors like temperature and low oxygen, which we'll talk about. Um, but what you can see is that's, that's making up a pretty significant proportion of the num total number of striped bass that are being taken out of the system every year. So the states, Maryland and Virginia, along with the other states with the Atlantic States Commission, decided they wanted to take action this year. They wanted to address specifically this issue of post-release mortality, and they wanted to bring the striped bass population back up to its target level. 
So um, Virginia instituted some uh, regulations actually last year, but also carried over this year into the actions that the Atlantic States Commission took. And what this uh, chart is showing you are the different regulations that were implemented last year and carried over into this year by Virginia in both the ocean and in the Chesapeake Bay. So one of the things I want you to really take a notice of um, on the end is the open season. So Virginia actually is open from May to June and then not open again until October through December. Next, Chris. Maryland decided to make things a little bit more complicated. So this chart, uh, don't worry about all of the things that are on there. Just know Maryland was weighing several different options and decided to go with uh, the option that's highlighted there in the red box. And what you'll see is Maryland also instituted a closure in the summertime, but it's about 16 days long. So it's from the 16th of August to the 31st of August. Next, Chris. You may be wondering why so much focus on the summertime, and that gets back to the interrelationship that striped bass have with their, um, with their habitat during this time of year. So during the summertime, obviously, air temperatures increase and water temperatures increase. And striped bass generally um, do better in terms of their physiology, in terms of how well they're doing um, in cooler waters. So the heat of the air temperature and the water temperature at the surface sort of pushes them down into cooler parts of the water column. But the other problem that we have in the summertime, as Chris mentioned, is that low oxygen. So we also have low oxygen at the bottom, which is pushing those striped bass further up into the water column. So that results in this phenomenon that we call habitat squeeze. And basically what that means is that those striped bass are squeezed within a very small band of suitable habitat uh, in the middle of the water column. And what that means is it also puts these striped bass in a smaller physical space. So they're competing for food with one another, there's a possibility that they're stressing each other out, there's a possibility that it could facilitate the transmission of disease. So that's why there's a focus uh, in these regulations on trying to reduce some of these other stressors during the summer. Chris? Yeah. Thanks, Allison. So there you go. <laughs> so uh, go Maryland has developed this striped bass fishing advisory system, and this is something that's specific to Maryland, but you could also take it and use it in your own angling adventures. Um, so every day Maryland puts out an advisory based on the air temperature. And this was based on studies that showed um, at temp air temperatures less than 95 degrees, uh, striped bass that were um, caught and released had a mortality rate less than 1%. But as soon as you get above 95 degrees in air temperature, that mortality rate increased almost 20%. So basically, anytime there's a red advisory, um, the advice is don't go fishing for striped bass, stay home or target something else. Next. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention this too, because this is uh, another mandatory regulation that's being implemented. Um, and that's the use of circle hooks. So you can see on the diagram on the right hand side, the difference between sort of a traditional J hook and a circle hook in both Maryland and Virginia, if they haven't already, will be implementing regulations to require the use of non-offset circle hooks. And you can see in the, in the photo on the left, that's because those are more likely to, um, uh, more likely to catch fish on the lip, uh, as opposed to J hooks, which they can swallow and can be caught deep. And hooking location is one of the other um, considerations that can determine whether or not a fish lives or dies after it's released. And circle hooks have been shown to improve survival of fish uh, much more than J hooks. So this is another thing where you can implement this now um, and go to your local tackle shop, ask for circle hooks, learn how to use them correctly, and, and you'll be able to use them just as well, catch just as many fish as you were before. Thanks, Allison. So uh, one of the things we want to do before we wrap up is, is actually give a, a quick update on a species that's not in our, our state of the day report, um, but is actually a, a, a very prominent bay species for a number of different reasons, uh, primarily because it's one of the species that's out there that serves as forage, which means it's eaten by a lot of other species and uh, out there, whether they're striped bass or ospreys or marine mammals like dolphins and whales, and that's Atlantic menhaden. 
And Chesapeake Bay Foundation has been involved in Atlantic Menhaden through that same organization that Allison mentioned, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and also at both the Maryland and Virginia state levels uh, for over 20 years. And why have we been involved in that? And it's basically because of, of these two slides, these, these two pictures on this slide here. Uh, one, although this is by far in terms of the amount of fish caught, it's the uh, largest fishery on the Atlantic coast, but it takes place in a very narrow geographic area generally, you know, either in the Chesapeake Bay or right around the mouth of the bay. Um, and, and so most of, the, most of the landings take place in this very narrowly defined geographic area. Uh, another reason that we've been very concerned about this is the uh, data there on the right shows you the number of juvenile menhaden coming uh, into the bay each year uh, as call as part of uh, the actually the striped bass young of the year survey. And so you can see that uh, we are, are very much down in terms of the average number of menhaden um, recruiting, which is fish coming into the bay um, over the last 20 years or so. And so uh, this basically concerns us because we're in a situation where are we have enough forage, enough fish out there to feed all those different predators of Atlantic menhaden. So osprey, striped bass, loons, um, summer flounder, you name it. Um, is there enough of, of those out there to do that? And so uh, we've been wrestling this, with this issue for, for a long time. And um, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission has been kind of moving in a direction to actually adopt ecological reference points, which we hope they'll do later this year. Uh, but about, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, they, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission actually set a cap on the harvest of Atlantic menhaden in the Chesapeake Bay by what we call the reduction fishery. And that's the, the really large uh, fishery uh, in Chesapeake Bay. Um, they harvest about 150,000 metric tons um, of menhaden um, from the bay and, and from coastal waters in any given year. Um, that cap uh, started out at about 107,000 metric tons. It got reduced to about 87,000 metric tons. And then uh, about three years ago, through actions by volunteers like yourselves and, and conservationists, uh, that cap was lowered to 51,000 metric tons. And unfortunately last year, uh, Omega Protein actually caught uh, significantly more than that, about 30% more uh, in the Chesapeake Bay than they were allowed under that cap. And so that actually uh, caused a non-compliance finding by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission late last year uh, that non-compliance finding went to the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, and he upheld the conservation benefit of the Chesapeake Bay cap and upheld the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries actions when it comes to Menhaden. And so that actually kind of created a, a, a wave that also resulted in, in another piece of activity on the fisheries management front that Chesapeake Bay Foundation had been supporting uh, with lots of partners and with lots of individuals for years. And that was the transfer of Menhaden management from the General Assembly to the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. And uh, previously, the only fish species or shellfish species managed by General Assembly was Atlantic Menhaden. And uh, that was something that we just didn't feel like uh, did a good job managing a, a species. They meet for 45 or 60 days per year. Um, you know, fishery operates throughout the year. Uh, they just couldn't respond well to changes in the fishery and the needs of the fishery. So this is actually uh, the packed uh, committee room uh, that first heard the bill this, this uh, winter. And uh, we're really happy to report that uh, as of about a month and a half ago now, the Virginia Marine Resources Commission are managing um, Atlantic Menhaden and the overage or the excess harvest that uh, was taken from the bay last year will have to be paid back um, during the, the coming year. So I uh, hope you have learned a little bit uh, about the numerous fisheries that we have in Chesapeake Bay. Um, you can see here someone uh, uh, catching another one of the species we see, off, we see quite often and actually feeds a lot on Menhaden, and that's bluefish. Uh, but we wanted to give the microphone to Tommy one more time to talk about a little bit about what he sees on the horizon for some of our, our fisheries, especially as it relates to commercial oil. 
one of the biggest, biggest challenges for all of us is going to be um, working waterfronts and where we're going to land our boats, our product, where we're going to tie up. Uh, just in the creek that I've been working in for the last uh, 30 years, uh, homes have been developed and built and uh, more and more properties being built on and less and less commercial working waterfront available. Uh, commercial fishing businesses going out of business, crab picking houses, oyster processing plants, um, fish fish houses and things like that. There's just nowhere near as many as it used to be. I was thinking coming in the creek the other day that during the winter time, this creek where we're at now would be bustling all winter long from the crab dredge fishery. And our uh, resource managers decided to shut that down. Uh, there'd be 20 to 22 boats working out of this creek in the wintertime dredging crabs. And the only boat you see working out here in the wintertime is me, a 24 foot Carolina skiff, maybe one or two gill netters here and there catching bunkers or landing a few rockfish, but uh, nowhere near the activity that it used to be. So a combination of, uh, in my opinion, bad regulations like that and the loss of working waterfront and um, people to process our products is going to be challenging for people to continue doing this. One of the and obviously from from our perspective uh, making sure that we improve habitat is is another important piece of that so uh, shellfish fish species will, will have the, the best environment to, to grow and thrive and then we can have uh, thriving fisheries uh, on top of that. So turn it back to Tanner to talk about how you can become involved in that process. Hey everybody, uh, that was incredibly informative and we're getting a lot of great questions which we're trying to answer on the fly in the chat. So go back and check that out. Um, you know, they say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, I might modernize that expression to say there's no such thing as a free webinar. Um, and it wouldn't be a Chesapeake Bay Foundation event if we didn't uh, provide an opportunity to uh, take some meaningful action. And what you can see right here on the screen, and time is limited, so I'm gonna make this very quick, but um, this is an opportunity, you can, you can see the, uh, the link right there, and uh, Alice is gonna put it in our chat. But if you would please go visit this, uh, you know, at CBF, we educate, we restore, which you learned all about today, and we advocate, which is what I'm asking you, you all to do now. When those three things don't work, we are not afraid to litigate, and that's where uh, we find ourselves right now with the EPA. We have filed a, not a notice of intent to sue EPA for their lack of enforcement uh, to um, enforce the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint for Pennsylvania and the state of New York. So I really encourage you, and this is the, um, the attorneys general in DC, Maryland, and Virginia are filing parallel intents. This is a big deal. And the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint is what we work on year round, year after year since 2010. I cannot overstate the importance of this. So please take a moment tonight, go to that action alert. There's template language there, but I encourage you to write your own, read it, and, but write your own language. You can scrap our language entirely and speak from your heart, or you can use our language. The most important thing is to make your voice heard. So thanks for considering that, and I'll leave it, leave it there. Alice? Hi, everybody. We are recording it, sorry. Hi everybody, um, I'm Alice, I'm the marketing manager. You met me at the beginning of the program and we've got a lot of great questions. So I'm gonna, get, we put us back on gallery view. You should be able to see all of our really sharp speakers and we're gonna do a couple of questions for them. I believe the first question is from Mr. Bob Douglas. Um, he, this question will be for either Allison or for Chris. So he's, he's, he's addressing the decreased demand for oysters and he wants to know if that, um, is actually good for the resource because of the increase in the population and in its tributaries. Yeah, so uh, right now, the decreased demand is not happening at, and at a time where our wild harvest fisheries are taking place. Um, those fisheries, like, like we talked about, tend to take place October through about the end of March. And so uh, what, what has tended to happen with the downturn is that it's hurt mostly our private growers who are putting oysters out that we know are going to be harvested. And so the, the wild beds aren't, harvest, aren't being harvested right now. Uh, they tend to be, you know, out there, the oysters are getting ready to produce as water, water temps move up and things like that. But um, 
in, in general, you know, we feel like uh, the more investment that there is in our oyster resources, the better off the bay is going to be. A, a great example this year is the Virginia General Assembly made a historic investment in oysters, uh, $10 million for oyster restoration. Uh, they also put in about $4 million, $4 million like they had the last couple of years uh, for additional oyster restoration and also oyster replenishment. So uh, the oyster replenishment activities are, are ones that actually help support the wild fishery as well. So uh, we, we want to see obviously a, a well-managed, and when we say well-managed, you know, using the best available science fishery. But uh, at, at this time, most of the downturn has, has tended to hurt the, the commercial aquaculture operations much more than it has kind of the wild stocks. And I'll let Allison add to that if she would like to. All right. Um, I'm going to keep us on the oyster front for, actually, for a hot second. Um, so if oysters are filters for the bay, are there in, in, any contaminants ingested when we eat oysters? Any health concerns that need to be worried about? And should we not be eating them in months that, have an, that do not have an R in them? Um, Allison, do you want to go to that one first, and then I can, all, I can add to it? Uh, so the month that end in R was a very important um, sort of adage in the old days and, and a lot of things have changed the way that we produce oysters and the way oysters are consumed that have made oysters available pretty much year round. So um, obviously the advent of refrigeration <laughs> was huge for that. Um, previously the, uh, parts of that were to um, prevent people from eating oysters in the hot summer months where the transport of oysters could um, be problematic. Uh, but now we have great refrigeration. We have shellfish sanitation rules and guidelines that ensure that those oysters are fresh all the way from the uh, bay to your table. Um, the other thing that's true is a lot of oysters that are produced nowadays are actually non-reproductive. And so in the summer months is usually when oysters reproduce and oysters that are reproducing could be thin or their meats could be a little bit watery and not very appetizing just because they put so much of their energy into reproduction. But with the non-reproductive oysters that are used in some aquaculture operations nowadays, it makes them sort of plump and juicy year round and something that people can enjoy 12 months out of the year. Awesome. Um, I'm going to ask, I think we have two more questions. Uh, we, have more, we have a lot of questions, but we're going to ask two more in the interest of time because we're a little bit over. But I had to ask this one because they mentioned snakeheads. Are invasive species like snakeheads and blue catfish having effects on crabs and oysters? And then we'll have one more question after that. Yeah, so I, I'll start out with uh, blue cats because uh, it's one that I, we've spent a fair amount of time working on. Uh, I, I would say blue cats definitely are. Uh, there's a lot of concern about the overlap between blue cats and species, especially like uh, like blue crabs, because uh, those species do interact. And uh, the, the fact that uh, blue cats think of it as, as both a non-native and invasive species. And uh, one of the, the best uh, ways to describe that, I think, is uh, that I've ever heard is Greg Garman, who's a really well-respected fishery scientist at Virginia Commonwealth University said, you know, it was kind of like putting a Siberian a tiger out in the ecosystem because they did basically eat everything. Um, That's what it amounts to. And what we've actually seen over the last couple of years is their population has grown so much that even blue cats aren't growing as fast um, as they used to. And so we, we definitely have concerns about that. And we're seeing lots of efforts to try to develop fisheries for blue cats so we can uh, ensure that their ecological harm isn't what, what's most worried. And so I'll pitch it to Allison if maybe she wants to talk about snakeheads being there. A little more common in her neck of the woods. Yeah, so uh, snakeheads are another invasive species, another voracious predator of a lot of the juvenile fin fish species that are so important for commercial and recreational fisheries in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, they're really prevalent um, up in Maryland, especially in the area of the eastern, sh middle eastern shore. Um, and there have been documented impacts to the ecosystem, especially in the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. But in case Chris hasn't already mentioned it, the best thing you can do with these invasive species, if you can't beat them, eat them. So both blue cats and snakeheads are good eating fish, as they say. Um, and so we encourage people who catch a snakehead 
um, or a blue cat, if you want to try it out, um, eat it. Please don't transport them anywhere. That's the biggest no-no of all. Um, but uh, we hope that people will uh, enjoy catching them, enjoy eating them, and save the bay while you're at it. Let me ask a quick question, and people can go ahead and answer in the chat too. Raise your hand if you've ever eaten snakehead. Anyone? Anyone in the panel? No? no Not I even you, Chris Moore? I would have thought you would have had some snakehead. Uh, not consciously. <laughs> That's actually going to conclude our Q&A. Thank you guys so much. You have some really, this is a smart crew. Smart crew you've recruited here, Tanner, for the Brock Learning Series. Well, I, I'll, I'll take that. We had a great, uh, great response to this webinar and this, and this topic. And, you know, this is something we used to do every other month or quarterly, and now we're doing it once a month. So the next uh, one we're going to have is going to be on July 14th. We're giving everybody a nice chance to clear out from their 4th of July uh, holiday. And the topic is going to be litter, poultry litter, which is an issue that not a lot of people are familiar with. We all know about you know, street and water litter, uh, but we're going to talk about poultry litter, which is an emer emerging issue. Very, very important to bay pollution. We hope that you'll join us here. Um, uh, same kind of bad time, bad channel, 630 in the evening. Uh, Alice is going to post the link where you'll be able to register for that event very soon. And you can also go to that link to see the recording of this I want, um, if you want to review it. So um, I really would just like to thank everybody for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. You all have the best seat in the house. We could never put this many people at the Brock Center. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again. And Chris, if you'll take us to our moment of Bay Zen. Nope. This, yes. is, this is from the uh, Brock Environmental Center. These are oysters sort of frozen in uh, Pleasure House Creek in, uh, in February. Oh. Uh -oh. There we go. Oh, oh that's nice. Oh. Any cooling. All right. All right. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.